Near and far is the next programme this afternoon, looking at how people respond to volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. It begins in a minute. Now, here's an announcement for teachers. In this term's teacher's notes for near and far, there's a printer's error on the worksheet designed for classroom use after the last programme, Earth in Action. The latitude and longitude given as 5 degrees south, 10 degrees east, should read 5 degrees north and approximately 10 degrees east. On the morning of February the 4th, the clock on top of Guatemala Cathedral came to a sudden stop. Its mechanism had been smashed by the shock waves of a tremendous earthquake. And at that same moment, great cracks appeared in the thick walls that had stood intact for centuries. The masonry crumbled and the windows shattered. The earthquake lasted for 30 seconds. And by some miracle, the cathedral remained standing. But when the tremor had ended, much of the rest of Guatemala lay in ruins. I'm looking at film from the BBC's library of a major earthquake in Guatemala. It happened in 1976, which is when John Craven reported on it. The BBC library has literally thousands of rolls of film, and amongst them, are lots of stories about earthquakes and volcanoes. We can see from these stories what these disasters are like, in particular what kind of damage they do. I was looking at film with some people who were in Guatemala. Roy and Diana Battersby were there when it happened. They were living in a small Guatemalan town called Patsoon. <laughs> The earthquake knocked their town to the ground. It's like holding a small rag doll and shaking it violently. You're just being flung about all over the place for a very short period of time. And then it stopped. And there was a deathly still and a hush. And the obvious thing was to get out of the building. Many people died, particularly children and old people. The Battersby's neighbours lost one of their five children when their house collapsed. The mother, of course, and she said she got to three of them. The fourth one just sort of stumbled out by himself, but the fifth, the little girl, uh, didn't make it out. The earthquake struck early in the morning, and for the rest of the day, the survivors were finding out what had happened to their families and to their neighbours. I felt that very morning. Everybody you met was like a present. Um, oh, hello, Jose. Um, Alberto, you're here. And, and you, you greeted everybody because that was the first intimation you had that they were alive because you knew several who had already died. Um, and meeting everybody, and you were very, very glad to be alive. Everybody was. There was a huge feeling of relief in being alive, but everyone knew very well that they'd been struck by disaster. 
everybody was very frightened. Um, and I think even the young children, although they perhaps didn't realise what had happened, <laughs> knew that their town had fallen down. There was suddenly no town there, all the familiar things, streets just weren't there anymore. Um, I suppose after a few days, it, they found the new things exciting. People were arriving, the trucks were coming. I felt uh, a lot of the children uh, thought it was very exciting, rather like playing on a large building site all the time. But I think after novelty wore off, people just wanted to get back to living normally again. Life goes on, everything goes on, but there's just no houses there. But the people of Guatemala couldn't simply go back to life as it was. News reporters arrived and told the world that Guatemala needed help. This report was shown in Britain and America. The Guatemalan Health Service is desperate. One doctor said a major relief effort is needed, medicines and equipment, if they are to do more than just warehouse these earthquake survivors. Fred Francis, NBC News, Guatemala City. We see appeals for help after disasters in newspapers and on television. But what can we do to help? What do you think people would need after their homes have been destroyed? Food, blankets, medicines, clothes? Well, apparently some people just bundled up whatever they thought would be useful and posted it to Guatemala. This was the result. A lot of supplies arriving are worthless, a waste of money, creating a waste of valuable time here. Colonel Ronald Sanduval, a member of the Guatemalan Emergency Committee, explains that medicines thrown together into a box and shipped off would take skilled people many hours to sort and discover if the medicines are fit for use. Guatemalans say they're most grateful for the aid that's being received here, but they point out that high-heeled shoes or half a pair of shoes can be of little use. Obviously, that's not the way to help. It's much more sensible to get in touch with an organization that knows what's wanted and is sending people to help. Then you can ask the organization what it needs. Mainly, of course, they'll want money, but they may ask you to make a blanket or find some old clothes. Relief organizations exist all over the world. The International Red Cross and the United Nations contact them whenever a major disaster strikes, and then they try to help. British relief organisations like Oxfam and the British Red Cross work together as a disasters emergency committee. When news came out about the Guatemalan earthquake, hundreds of thousands of people sent money to them. Oxfam had a man on the spot in Guatemala. His name, Reggie Norton. And I asked him, I said, well, what do you need? Do you need food? Do you need shelter? Do you need medicines? And they said, we have enough food, but it's buried at the bottom of our houses, which have all collapsed. If you give us some tools, we can dig that food out. And this is the time of the year when we're normally preparing the land before sowing. If we're going to be able to survive, we must be able to plant our crops and get the food that we survive on. Then they also said, we're going to need something to build a temporary house with. And we think that the best thing is to have some corrugated iron sheeting. We eventually provided enough sheeting so that every family in the area, and there were 15,000 families, could buy 10 sheets at half the price that the sheets had cost us. So we tried to convince them one is able to build a house in the same style that they're used to having their houses, but houses which now will be safe if there is another earthquake and many people have done that. This is how Oxfam hoped people would rebuild their homes. Not on sloping ground, where the land can easily slip away, but on level ground. And well spaced, so that one house can't knock down others. They've painted all these instructions onto these sheets of cloth because it stands up to wind and weather much better than paper. Oxfam also wanted people to build their houses in a new way. They wanted them to build wooden frames like this. Traditional houses don't have any frames. They're built from mud blocks called adobe. 
These are adobe bricks. They're made from mud held together with straw. And they're very heavy and crumbly. The roofs are also very heavy because they're made out of clay tiles like these. All these materials, the clay, the straw and the mud, are found in the earth around. So people built their houses very simply, but they were very, very heavy. You can probably guess what happened when the earth shook. Roofs caved in as the walls collapsed and buried people. That's why Oxfam wanted people to build something much safer, like this. The roof is made of corrugated iron, which is less heavy and dangerous than tiles. And the walls are built in a new way as well, as you can see here. There's a wooden frame to hold the house together when the earth shakes, and these firm blocks are held in place by barbed wire. The barbed wire and the corrugated iron had to be bought by the Guatemalan people if they wanted to build a house like this. Oxfam could have given them the materials free, but the people of Guatemala wanted to pay what they could. It's a matter of pride. Mind you, although these houses are much safer, an awful lot of people still preferred the older houses to live in. The traditional houses were built of adobe, which are huge, thick mud bricks which are super because they keep you nice and warm during the cold nights and they keep you nice and cool during the hot days. But unfortunately, they're structurally not very sound and they're no good at all in earthquakes. It's sad, really, in the sense that the houses being built now with the corrugated iron roofs and walls look so dreadful. What we've seen now, it now looks like rather like a collection of double garages. I suppose we'll get used to them. The look of a house is one thing, but what's it like to live in? Well, it's a bit gloomy, and I should think it's pretty noisy when it rains on that roof. But I wonder what it's like in an earthquake. Well, I don't feel too good, but amazingly, the house is still standing. And it needs to be, because earthquakes are really very common in Guatemala. Wherever earthquakes happen, people can and do try to protect themselves with buildings like these. But what about people who live near volcanoes? What can they do? Every few years, Mount Etna in Sicily begins an eruption. All too often, the people living there have to move out. They lock the doors behind them because they hope to come back, though that isn't always possible. Hot red lava blocks the road, and as it inches forward, it sets fire to the vines in the fields. But these vines are growing on the lava from the last eruption. Because when it cools, lava helps to make a very rich and fertile soil. That's why the farmers live here. When the lava's cold, they'll return to prepare the ground for a new crop. For them, the risks are worth taking. The people of Iceland also live in the shadow of volcanoes, and they also accept the risks. Iceland's volcanoes can be very dramatic, but there's usually time to escape when you have to. In 1973, the town of Heimahe was buried and burned by the lava and ash from a volcano. Like the villagers in Italy, the people of Heimahe also had to pack up and leave. And like the villagers in Italy, they sealed up their houses because they too were going to come back as soon as the eruption ended. The town almost disappeared from view, but everyone escaped safely.
While they were away, the lava poured into the sea and created more land next to the town. And when they came back, they found the walls of lava had made a fine new harbour. It was an enormous job to clear up when they did return. They had to dig the houses out of the ash. But today, Hema'e looks as good as new. The people of Iceland have even made good use of their volcanoes. This land of snow and ice is full of surprises. This is a hot spring. The heat comes from underground volcanic rock. No matter how cold the weather, the water for this swimming pool stays hot, heated by underground steam. In the past, Icelanders even did their washing in water from the hot springs. And to bake bread, you didn't put it in an oven, you buried it. When you dug it up, the heat from the molten rock under the ground had done the cooking for you. Icelanders have even drilled down into the earth to tap the heated water there. They use the hot steam they pipe up to heat greenhouses. Iceland even grows its own bananas. They also use it to heat their water and their homes. The capital of Iceland, Reykjavik, has no fires or boilers in the houses. Nobody needs them. The Italians also take power out of the ground. In certain places, the land steams with volcanic heat and they put it into pipes. Here at Ladarello in southern Italy, they use underground steam to make electricity. Volcanoes have all sorts of uses, even when they've gone cold. Many roads are made with stone chippings taken from the heart of a volcano. This volcano last erupted 400 million years ago. Now the explosions are caused by dynamite to break up the rock. The volcano is in Shepton Mallet in Somerset. Today it's a quarry. So there are all sorts of benefits from volcanoes, but not from earthquakes. Earthquakes don't help crops to grow. In fact, it seems that earthquakes are no good at all to the people who live where they happen. So why do people go on living in a place where there's a good chance of being killed? People live there because they have to go on living there. There's no other place for them to go. What little land they have is tremendously important for them because it's on that land that they will be able to grow most of the food they require for themselves and their families during the year. So people who have land stay on it, whatever the risk. And even if a poor Guatemalan family has no land and moves into the city, they'll end up in a shack on the edge of a steep ravine where the earthquake risk is just as great. All over the world, it's usually the poorest people who suffer most in earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. As safe as houses. Have you ever said that? To be safe in an earthquake, a house needs to be rather special. 
afterwards you you never regard it solid earth if you come in on an aeroplane i used to think oh great solid earth but you you can never feel that again you, you know now that the earth underneath your feet is as about as solid as a jelly and at any moment it can shake violently and it, it really changes your whole idea about earth and what's solid earthquake resistant houses are one answer to the problem and someday scientists hope to be able to predict when danger threatens so that people can escape in good time. They've managed it in some places already and they can tell what areas are dangerous. But still, earthquakes and volcanoes continue to strike unexpectedly. People just have to live with them. Every year, new reports appear of the damage they do. This one was in January 1980 struck late yesterday in the Portuguese Azores. It has reduced the main town on the island of Tursia to ruins. So far, 40 bodies have been found and over 400 people have been injured. Rescue workers are still digging through the rubble of collapsed buildings in search of victims. Tents, food, and medical equipment are being rushed to the island. 